Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a supplement to my ClassicsToday.com review of this absolutely fabulous disc that just came out on the Undine label. It's called America Scapes, as in not America Escapes, but Landscapes, only of America. Get it? Everything has to have a title these days. So this has one. And it has features, let's see, the the Basque National Orchestra, which did that wonderful Ravel album just shortly ago, under the leadership of Robert Trevino, who seems to be into leather jackets. I don't have a scarf for him, thank God, at least not yet. And this really is four fabulous pieces that are so worth listening to. Well, three of them are. One of them is sort of on, 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 on the cusp, shall we say. But I want to tell you what they are. You can go read my classicstoday.com review, and then you can watch this bit of performance art or the other way around, whatever you want, as I enact my classicstoday.com review. Really is a great disc. So, the first piece, Charles Martin Loeffler, Loeffler, or however you want to pronounce it, who lived from 1861 to 1935. We get La Mort de Tintagiles. Okay, what is La Mort de Tintagile, I guess, in French? It's a puppet play, believe it or not, by Maurice Metterlink, you know, he of Peleus and Melisande fame. He wrote these these sort of fuzzy, mysterious, uh, symbolist plays, they were called. It was called Symbolism. Symbolism is fairy tales for grown-ups. That is, things that are just silly and make no sense, and they, well, anyway, this is silly and makes no sense. Tinta Giles is someone, he's a puppet, I guess. I mean, it's a puppet play, but in the character is hated by some evil queen who wants to kill him because she's killed all the rest of his family. So she does. That's the story. Anyway, it takes 25 minutes, and Loeffler was sort of a, a, a late romantic decadent kind of guy. I mean, everyone compares him to Richard Strauss. He was actually a contemporary. He wouldn't really, I don't think he needed to borrow much from Strauss to do what he did. And, and oh, the music is juicy and lovely and, and it rises to a nice evil climax with a healthy swat on my old buddy back here, you know? It's like, ooh, yes, it's wonderful. And, and there's a solo viola d'amore, which is a hopeless failure of an instrument that sounds really good in this piece. It says something about Loeffler's ability. Janicek used it a lot, but only because he liked the name, not because he even knew what one sounded like. It's a very dusky, husky sort of instrument, and it sounds really good in this piece. I can tell you, it's a beautiful performance. And for 25 minutes, you're going to have a nice, decadent hog wallow. I mean, that's what the thing is. It's great. Next, Carl Ruggles, who could not be more different. Carl Ruggles, well, he lived forever. He lived from, from 1876 to 1971, and he wrote like seven pieces of music, although there are multiple versions of some of them. He was uh, unbelievably, unbelievably self-critical, extremely obnoxious, a hardcore curmudgeon, racist, anti-Semite, cranky, cantankerous son of a bitch. That's what he was. He didn't like anything. He didn't even like his own music. He was a painter. He painted a lot. He was very prolific as a painter. He had art shows and things like that. And and like I said, he lived to be like a million and, and left these seven pieces. He was one of those American maverick types who at the, you know, for the beginning of the 20th century was writing in an atonal style, entirely his own, his most famous piece. As some of you may know, is Sun Treader, which Michael Tilson Thomas recorded a couple of times. It's really a great work. Uh, he was a fine composer for what he did, um, no matter how revolting a human being he may have been, but that's nothing new in this business. You know, <laughs> The majority of them were probably revolting in one way or another. And this piece is called Evocations. It's a little four movement suite, 10 minutes long. Um, all of the movements are slowish. It exists as a piano version as well. But uh, this is really a, um, it's, it's, I, there's no way to describe it. It's atonal melodic, 
relentlessly grindingly dissonant but somehow it all works. It really is quite evocative, and the movements are quite short, and it's fun to listen to. His music has great intensity and great passion, and you can sense that from the very beginning. And so, you know, when you listen to it, you just kind of let it wash over you, and it's it's an experience, it really is. And he deserves to be heard. I'm very excited, actually, that they, they put this on here, because, Ruggles isn't going to get a lot of attention otherwise, outside of, you know, you know, Rugluch, which I guess are the people who like Ruggles. The Rugluch cult will go for it, but anyone else? I don't know. Then we have Howard Hansen. The world premiere recording of a short tone poem, less than seven minutes, called Before the Dawn, which Hansen basically abandoned, and you know why. This is the the one dud in the bunch. It's not a terrible piece, not at all. It's handsome, it's melodic, it's pleasant, but it's so, so bland. It's absolutely bland. I mean, you know, if, if, if you think that a composer who came from Wahoo, Nebraska was going to be kind of Midwestern, milk toasty, bland, then yes, you are right. That's what this is. Hansen became far more interesting, I think, in, in the works that he acknowledged and recorded on his own. And, you know, some of them are quite splendid. But boy, this is just a, a dull little bit of conservative fluff. That's all it is. And not fluff in the good sense. Like, you know, Massenet was good fluff, you may recall. This is fluffy fluff. It, 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 it starts sort of, you know, with this vaguely pleasant, you know, blandness, and then it rises to a rather bland climax, and then it just stops, very unsatisfyingly, I might add. I mean, it's it's nice to have it on the disc. It sounds really good between the Ruggles and the last work on the disc. It's well programmed as a little interlude. You know, you get up, you stretch, go have a cookie, you know, get yourself a drink while it's playing, and then sit down for the main event. Because the main event, oh, baby. Boy, if we got a main event, it's Henry Cowell's Variations for Orchestra. Now, Henry Cowell, you may recognize because we just did a piece by Henry Cowell, The Banshee in Miniature Masterpieces. He was a fascinating, fascinating composer, enormously prolific, experimental, one of those eclectic, let it all hang out kind of guys. He really, really needs to be taken seriously and needs a systematic um, survey of his music by somebody somehow because, because everything that I've heard has really been interesting. Nothing has been bad, and he really, he really, I mean, he wrote a bunch of symphonies, he wrote tons of orchestral music, tons of piano music and chamber music, it just, he's really cool. This is his Variations for Orchestra, it's a major work, it's about 20 minutes long. The theme is this sort of declamatory, stentorian bunch of brass chords, or a line brass, not really a melody, sort of a motive. And the variations are so much fun, so interesting. There's there's a moment towards the end, I have to say, where the the bass recitative from the finale of Beethoven's Ninth just slinks in for like half a second, and you immediately recognize what it is, and you just sit up and you go, "What? What was that? <laughs> Why is that there?" But it is. And I want, to, I want to just play you a little bit of one of the central variations. He was a pioneer in writing for percussion instruments. And here is a little bit of the percussion-led, I don't know which variation it is, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's really cool. It's just really cool. Here's the climax of that variation. Thank you. 
but then the whole piece is just just overflowing with inventiveness. Sometimes you recognize the theme, sometimes you don't. But like all good sets of variations, it all holds together somehow for some reason and and leaves you wanting more. It really does. So it only remains to be said that the sonics are fantastic, as I'm sure you just noticed. The playing is really great. The programming is original and dynamic and fascinating. And these guys are two for two. They're doing well. I can't wait to see what else they have in store for us because this has just been marvelous. And I'm so, so delighted that this came out on Undine. And you know, I have to say, I mean, I'm delighted it came out on Undine. And thank God for like Naxos, which is uh, sort of the parent company now of Undine, and that they spend some time doing American music because God knows the Americans aren't doing it. I mean, the, the like, Americans, there, are there any American labels? Yeah, there must be some. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, there's a whole fabulous legacy of music, especially from the first half of the 20th century, those symphonists, and then the minimalists, and then the romantic, the neo-romantics. I mean, there's just great, great, great stuff that was written and is being written by American composers, and and they really need to have some sort of serious, dedicated edition and um, I, I, Naxos, I think, should start boxing up its American classic stuff, you know, the Gerard Schwartz material and whatnot, and, you know, organizing it somehow, because there's really great American music that doesn't get anything like the attention it deserves. And I'm not saying that because I'm American. I'm saying that because it's really good. So keep on listening, folks. Grab Americascapes, and I'll see you very shortly. Take care.